welcome everybody. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, welcome to Pedro Tools Artist in Resident Opening Artist Talk. Uh, I'm Nathan Stanfield, the studio manager at the American Museum of Ceramic Art in Southern California. Uh, AMOCA champions the art, history, creation, and technology of ceramics through exhibitions, collections, outreach, and studio programming. Today's artist talk focuses on the work of Pedro Tool, who has just begun a year-long residency in the Amoka Ceramic Studio. Uh, Amoka's Artist in Resident program, established in 2012, is one of the few long-term fellowship opportunities for ceramic artists on the West Coast. Our residency program, which provides artists an opportunity to produce or develop a new body of work, is funded through the generous support from Julianne and David Armstrong, Laguna Clay, and the Wingate Foundation. Uh, the next call for residency applications will be in January of 2024. So stay tuned. Uh, today, Paige will be sharing some of the work she's completed recently and talk about the plans for her time as the artist and resident here at Amoka. Also joining us today are Amoka's executive director, Beth Ann Gerstein, and our exhibitions manager, Pam Aliaga, who both have been instrumental in supporting and championing ceramic art artists and growing our artist and resident program. So thank you. Uh, they'll be doing some sort of behind the scenes work here today and managing the Zoom chat as well. Uh, now, I'm excited to tell you a little bit about Paige before we get started. Uh, Paige O'Toole is a ceramic artist from Garrison, New York, focusing on the intersection of gender, space, and the domestic. Her work explores themes of memory through gesture and illusion through perception. O'Toole's mark in clay is both immediate and archival, lasting and tangible evidence of her insatiable touch. She received her MFA at the New York State College of Ceramics at Alfred University and holds a BA in art history and a BFA in ceramics from the University of New, Paul, uh, New York at New Paltz. Uh, O'Toole has been in residence at Amoka since August of this year and will be continuing until July of next year. Uh, before Paige starts her presentation, I wanna remind everybody this talk is being recorded, so please mute yourself and there will be an opportunity for Q&A after the presentation. Uh, and now I will turn the presentation over to Paige. Thank you, Nathan. Um, okay, I'm gonna figure out how to share my screen. Is it up? Are you? Yes. Yeah, all good? Okay. Yes. All right, hello everyone. Thank you, Nathan, for that intro. Um, and thank you to everyone else for joining in. Um, I wanted to start by thanking everyone here at Amoka, one for selecting me to be a resident here this year, and also for being so warm, welcoming, and supportive. Um, I've been here for a little over a month now, and uh, I can't even begin to express how wonderful this place is, and I'm really looking forward to the rest of my year here. Okay, so now on to the work. So I thought I'd start this by telling you a little bit about myself and my path in clay. Uh, here is a photo of me with one of the pieces I made at Alfred for my thesis exhibition. I'm from Garrison, New York. It's a small town about an hour north of New York City on the Hudson River. I found ceramics my freshman year at SUNY New Paltz in 2016. I saw a spot had opened up in an intro class and I jumped in and I fell in love with the material almost immediately as most of us do. Um, while I was at New Paltz, I double majored in ceramics and art history. And I just wanna say, I, I can't recommend that program enough. I owe a lot of where I am today to the mentorship of Brian Sebes and Anat Shipton. Their generosity and continued presence in my life means the world to me. Um, in 2019, I had the privilege to study abroad. I spent a summer in Italy studying art restoration um, and conservation sciences, and that was really the beginning of the work that I'm making now. Um, this is an image I took while I was in Florence at the Pitti Palace. It's an elaborate empty frame hanging over this rich red velvety wallpaper. Um, seeing this, it really struck me because it was the first time that I started to think about the frame outside of the context of painting. Um, it made me consider the frame as more than an object, but as a concept. Um, I've become really interested in the way 
that a frame commands attention, but at the same time, we're conditioned to ignore it. Um, and the same lines as the, the sculpture or the pedestal is to the sculpture or architecture is to people. Um, overwhelmed by this rich history and the powerful presence of decorative arts in Europe, I went back to my studio with a new set of questions. Um, okay. This image is of a piece that I made in my final semester at New Paltz. I graduated in May, in, in May of 2020, so during the early days of the pandemic. Um, this piece, along with others I was making at the time, was titled Some Variation of a Frame Composition. This piece is a little over three feet tall, and it was the beginning of a love and a strong desire to make large work. It was also the beginning of technical exploration for me. I wanted to make work that had minimal contact with the ground. Um, so my solution was to start building things to a certain height and then flip them over and then build on top of that flip. So if you can, I don't know, can you see my cursor? This is the, the seam, this is two pieces. And so that's where the, in, in my mind, what I was calling this was a pedestal to the piece that was sitting on top. Um, so yeah, I was trying to create my own pedestal because I'm really interested in having that conversation with the thing that supports the thing. Um, I saw these as all kind of abstract iterations of frames. Like I was starting with the, footprint of a frame and then intuitively building, responding to the form as it grew. Um, with these works, symmetry was really important to me um, in a different way than it is now. I think I have a healthier relationship with it now. I think when I was making this work, it was bringing out a kind of OCD that I didn't know I had and um, I would get really lost and trapped in it. Um, yeah, so while I was studying ceramics in undergrad, I was also doing a BA in art history. Um, I focused a lot of my research on frames, questioning why something um, integral to the understanding of an art object was not a part of our conversation in class. I wondered why in my art history education, we weren't studying the decorative arts or seemingly craft in any capacity. The only way I was having those conversations was in my ceramics classes there seemed to be this big disconnect between the two subjects that I loved. And uh, I think with the work that I started making here, I was trying to resolve that disconnect. For me, it was a matter of representation, more specifically symbolic of a larger discussion, the hierarchies between wealth and status, art and craft, structure and decoration. I see the frame as a transitional space that moves the viewer through the world of, or moves the viewer through the imaginary world of the painting to the reality of the wall. Ideas of framing um, and questioning perceived value are still prevalent in my work. So right out of undergrad, I started a year long residency at the, Clare, the Saratoga Clay Art Center uh, in Saratoga Springs, New York. It's a lovely place with great people. And um, this is where I first learned to fire a gas kiln. So that was exciting for me. And this was a space where I really got to explore and push those ideas that I had only gotten to the surface of in undergrad. Uh, this residency allowed me the time, space and freedom to build up a portfolio that I needed to apply for grad school. Um, and to be honest, grad school was Um, yeah, so my time at Alfred was incredibly challenging for a lot of reasons, but um, it was also extremely rewarding. And in the end, I'm glad I did it. I It was like being in a really intense vacuum of ceramic knowledge. And some of my goals at Alfred were to push and challenge myself to build as big as possible. Um, and while there is a lot of content behind my work, I am so strongly motivated by technical challenges. Um, I love pushing the material to its limits and asking it to do what no one thinks it can. Is screen share not working? Uh, I am? No? Okay, am I doing it? 
Ah, I'm so sorry. Okay. Uh, okay. So yeah, pushing material to the limits. So my work still draws inspiration from decorative arts, uh, but my questions and parameters surrounding that have expanded. I've started thinking more about my intuitive building methods um, and my systems, thinking about the different languages of touch that I always go back to when I'm building an object. Um, grad school helped me get down to the what, where, why of my interest in the decorative arts. Once I got to grad school, I started doing more specific research and reading on Victorian era. Um, and I found that I'm really interested in gender dynamics and symbolism that objects can hold. And that led me to start thinking more specifically about furniture objects and in domestic spaces. Um, and as you can see now, my work has grown quite dramatically since, uh, or from where I started. Uh, are we okay? Yeah, okay. Um, uh, the work I was making when I entered school was um, abstract and the surface was almost always resolved in terra sigillata. Um, but I feel like I've left school now with a more holistic and colorful approach to my practice. I'm no longer scared of color and I'm using it to my advantage to reference a certain time or to place people in a specific context or even to evoke a certain feeling. Um, my two years at Alfred culminated in my thesis exhibition, which you're looking at um, a photo of now. Um, I titled my show, Sweet Rot. I'm gonna show you some images of the show as a whole, and then I'm gonna talk more specifically about individual objects that were in the show and what they meant to me and how I made them. Um, yeah, so here is a, a wide shot. It's not the entirety of the exhibition. There was another room off to the side, and I'm not going to talk about that today. Um, but I, I do want to read you a little abstract I wrote about the show. Sweet Rot is an exploration of duality, the fantasy of allure, desire, and grandeur, while also capturing a sharp and aggressive sense of discomfort that lives in the handling of the clay. In this work, I've been thinking about excess. Where is the point of too much? And is there a point of too much? The work hovers on the line of decadence and decay, picking at wealth and social classes and how excess in those spaces can become a kind of moral decay. A space where the value of objects and things is more important than that of people. The objects have a cloying play between beauty and grotesque that speak to the nefarious nature of their inspiration. This body of work is emerging of opposing forces, like when sweetness begins to rot. Here's another angle of that main room. Um, now I wanna read another portion from my thesis titled Clay as Catharsis to give you some more context to the work. I overwhelmingly desire chaos, it's intoxicating. The way I can be engulfed and overcome by a room full of things, by objects. I like to be surrounded, to nest. I find comfort in this space. I love ornament because I love excess, decadence, sitting at the edge of never enough. I want to be loud, to unapologetically take up space, to be seen, to be heard. I build with urgency because my touch is gluttonous, how wondrous it feels to indulge. I feed off the energy of desire, wanting more, needing more, being more. My touch in clay is both immediate and archival. It's lasting and tangible evidence of me. The work is exclusively hand-built. What you're looking at now um, is a piece titled Armchair in Green. This, uh, let's see, okay. Um, here is our some process photos of loading it into the kiln. You can see my friends are making faces at me because I was consistently asking people for help lifting things. And I just wanna say that building large work is an adventure, but it's not for the faint of heart. Um, it really does take a village and it takes a lot of patience 
and making the piece is only half the battle. Um, requires large kilns, a lot of heavy lifting, and begging friends for help. Uh, so I just want to thank everybody that was a part of this journey. So, hmm. yeah, so while I was at Alfred, I developed a lot of kind of building systems for myself to make these objects. And you can see here with this piece, I was making these kind of support risers so that I could build this chair as one unit. So the legs were attached. And this way, post firing, I could pop off that support riser and it would um, rest on its own four legs, like you can see in this photo. Um, generally, I have two different building methods that are determined by the type of object I'm going to make, one being what I call a representational render and the other being a fragmented render. Objects that would fit into the representational render are this chair and also this piece, standing clock. This piece is just shy of six feet tall. Um, it has this incredible lean um, that is partially my doing and maybe more so the kiln. <laughs> um, it, it's built in two separate parts. And uh, so the, the clock face, you can see here this seam, the clock face pops off. Um, and that way it's more manageable to move around and. But um, yeah, it's honestly so just still so surprising to me that it stands. It's it causes me so much anxiety to look at it. You, I don't even know that you can tell from the angle of this photo, but it is such a severe lean. It um, it's just a miracle to me that it that it hasn't given way at this kind of joint here with the weight from the top. But it's still standing, and it's a piece that I'm really excited about. Um, so yeah, back to the idea of the representational render. These objects are built with a definite set of parameters. Um, I'm, I draw, I print references, I measure, I build. Building these objects happens fast because my, desire out, my desired outcome is known. Um, fragmented renders, on the other hand, would be like this piece, sweet seat of my emotions, this piece, um, comes from a place where there's not a specific outcome in mind. Um, and it's definitely one of, it's definitely my favorite piece that I made in my time at Alfred. It's now in the permanent collection of the Alfred Ceramic Art Museum. Um, it's really so special to me because it is a constant reminder of how important failure is in my process. This is the first and hopefully the last piece that I've ever blown up in the kiln. Um, yeah, so this piece I did not preheat long enough, and the support riser that I made for the base of the form, of the chair form, it blew up and it kind of took out um, most of this structure. And so when I opened that kiln door, I was I was heartbroken, but I wasn't ready to let go of what I had envisioned for that piece. So I saved all the rubble and I brought it back to my studio, and I lived with it for a few months and. Uh, at a, at a certain point, I was just, I figured why not give it a shot and glaze it. And so I did, I glazed all the parts separately. Um, and I really liked what was happening there. So, um, here are some, pardon my messy studio, but here are some process shots of, of making this piece come back to life. So on the left, you can see, um, I'm kind of ratchet strapping and epoxying the whole form back together. It was kind of in four major parts. Um, yeah, and also the whole center had blown out. So I kind of had to make up what was going on in there with all the, the scraps. And, but yeah, I, I, I was really enjoying what was happening once I was epoxying it. So I knew I needed to keep going. And I built these like solid, crazy tall legs that I, um, epoxied at like post fire once everything was finished. Um, yeah, so you I mean you can see they're kind of ridiculous, like these beefy animated legs. Um, uh, yeah, so 
I, oh, there were so many points in making this that I wanted to give up, but I'm so glad I didn't. Um, I learned so much from this piece and I really think it was a huge turning point for me in grad school. Um, yeah, I want to come back to that idea of the fragmented render. Um, um, yeah, so these objects are built more with the idea that ornament is taking on form. That form is made through growing and through falling. And when I say falling, I literally mean falling. There are so many times when I'm building these things that they just kind of collapse and give way. And I just say, okay, I'm gonna build off the rubble. Um, and I just keep going. And it's really a trust in the material to tell me what to do. Um, each coil morphs and adapts to fit the whims of the growing sculpture. It's a repetitive process that um, transforms in rhythm with every pinch I make. And in this format, I'm really building intuitively and I'm responding to the material as if we're in conversation. So when I'm in the studio, I work best when I give myself a set of parameters. Sometimes I'll do exercises where my parameter is that I can only build an object um, in the round from looking at one side. So there ends up being a very obvious front and a very obvious back where one side is cared for and the other is not. Another parameter is scale. Sometimes I make work for the sole purpose of challenging myself to go bigger or challenging myself to go smaller. But my favorite parameter is symmetry. Um, almost all of the work is constructed under the parameter of bilateral symmetry. So in order to work symmetrically, I build using both hands simultaneously, like this is how I'm working. Um, it's tricky, and, but it can also be quite meditative. And it becomes a way to step outside of myself, um, kind of get lost in my thoughts. But when I'm doing this, everything becomes calm. I build fast, quick globs of wet, sticky clay get piled together. When I'm building in clay, it's as if my hands speak before I do. It feels like a dance or a fluid conversation that I'm having with the material. Each piece builds and grows, reflecting my lived experiences and my emotional processes. There's aggression in the way I handle the clay, but at the same time, there's, there's a deep admiration for the material. Um, I love the way that clay responds to touch. It holds the memory of Mark like a cast of my hands in motion. The physical act of making for me uh, is so much about touch. But it's honestly, it's so challenging to put words to something that feels so nonverbal. There's a lot of comfort and control within the process that does not live on in the finished work. Nothing about the outward appearance of the work I make is comfortable. Um, so this next, so this text I'm showing you is a snapshot from my thesis. I wrote this portion as a sort of glossary or an index um, of my internal dialogue. These are the things I'm thinking about when I make a mark. Um, these are like my systems of touch and um, it's like a catalog of moves I can always go back to when I'm building. So I'll just read like two of them. The first one, a palm squish. It's a soft and gentle squish. My thumbs cradle the clay as I walk down the line of the coil. An angsty squeeze. How I build a centerpiece. It starts with a big ball of sticky clay. Bigger than a grapefruit, smaller than a cantaloupe. I wrap both hands around the clay, like how one might hold a phone to text. Thumbs front and center while the others get ready in the back. I squeeze. Inward and tightly wound, the clay begs to be freed. The work is visceral. Touch is the luscious, tangible, and inescapable entrance to the work for me. For you, my touch is rigid and sharp. We both experience the fragility of the material, but on opposing sides. We have the capacity to squeeze something malleable in our hands, to feel the satisfaction of imprinting ourselves. The work invites that memory of feeling. The intensity of Mark overwhelms 
me and you. It's physical, it's mental, it's all consuming. I'm overcome with the need for more and maybe you a desire for less. So now I wanna talk about this piece. Um, I titled it uh, Invitation to Indiscretion. Um, it's about seven feet long um, and I think three feet in width and four feet in height, somewhere around there. It's huge. Um, here, uh, let's see. Here is a photo of it being built in my studio. Um, this was the largest and honestly most painful thing I ever attempted to make. <laughs> it, I had over an eight foot pallet taking up the center of my studio for almost two months. Um, it was a lot and um, it was really challenging. The, the body of the piece is made in three separate sections because Alfred does not have an eight foot kiln. So I had to fire two of the sections in one kiln and the last in another. Um, here are some more process photos and some of my studio friends. Um, this is kind of the post-fire assembly that happened. Um, uh, yeah, so the legs are wooden, prefab legs that I just bought from Lowe's, um, and they're covered with plasticine to hold that like wet clay look that everything else had. Um, this was just another attempt for me to figure out like a lot of the things I was making was trying to solve the problem of the legs and I'm still not sure I have the solution, but I know that this isn't one of them. <laughs> this, um, they were incredibly wobbly and not stable. And every time I moved it from gallery to gallery or from my studio to storage, I thought even just like the wind was gonna knock it over. Um, yeah, this is not a method I will be going back to, but um, it's a learning curve. I see all of my failures in the studio as a, as a building, as something to build on. Um, hmm. So here again is another image of this piece that's finished and installed in the space. You can see that I flipped that center section for the install. Um, and this was to reference, um, yeah. um, this was to reference, I was looking at a lot of like uh, 19th century conversation chairs. Um, so here is a photo. I wasn't trying to directly replicate this exact chair or any exact chair, but it's more just the idea of that, having that kind of in-between space and um, creating a kind of obstacle or sort of boundary. Um, they're objects with rules and intentions, and that's something that I'm interested in. Um, okay, so this piece um, is called If I Held Up a Mirror and to Which People Look While People Stare. This piece is uh, a little over 15 feet, maybe 16 feet as a whole. Um, and it's about 10 feet in height, and it comes out into space about six feet. It was made with a sculptural high fire porcelain body, um, and I was creating kind of modular sculptural tile. Um, I took the traditional form of Bozerie and deconstructed it into both parts on the wall and off. Um, layers were shifting from the wall to floating in space, fragmenting our understanding of traditional form. Warped lines of sight and physical disconnect in the space that asked the viewer to contemplate their surroundings. Approaching the work head on, it's a picture of symmetry. Um, I was trying to orchestrate the viewer's, viewer's experience and play with the perception of symmetry. I was using symmetry as an aesthetic form and an unconscious tool. Um, because we're seduced by these forms because symmetry has long been understood as an ideal for beauty. 
by way of evolution and survival. And the way that I'm working with it, it unfolds and breaks down as you move off center and as you, as you walk into that in-between space. It's a space that you gravitate towards that you want to look closer, you want to understand what you're seeing, but with tight layers in space and objects looming overhead, um, you can't help but feel a little uncomfortable. And I wanted to play with this kind of tension in knowing what to expect um, as you enter the space versus what you actually feel when you're inside of it. So a big part of the show was about emphasizing the spectacle of grandeur. Um, the furniture objects were made as representations of absent figures. So each object in the room held its own gaze. Uh, the two chairs at center would watch you while you're standing at the theater box watching the mirror and the conversation watches them watch you. So it's this kind of game of gazes. Uh, when I set out to build this installation, I was thinking about um, impressionist paintings like La Loge by Renoir or um, In the Loge by Mary Cassatt. Both of these paintings uh, are about gaze, but I was especially interested in Cassatt's painting, um, the one at right. Um, in this painting, the woman is intensely staring across the crowd um, through her binoculars. She, wow, she's being looked at. See this man over here, it's looking at her, but also we're looking at them. Like we are viewers of this painted space. So this painting to me really kind of symbolized the ownership of power of a woman and her gaze. I think that Cassatt found a lot of strength in this subject matter because in her time, the opera was one of the only spaces where women could and did attend. With this idea in mind, I created my own theater box um, or an observatory. Um, I wanted this to be a space that would draw attention, but also provide protection. Um, this piece, is an amalgamation of all of my systems of touch. It's built on uh, intuition, symmetry, and repetition. This object really invites a spectacle because it becomes a place to see, watch, and observe, a place to see and be seen. Um, this mirror, the centered uh, object in suspended in space, is backed with a mirror that I made. I had sheet glass cut to the shape of the ceramic object I made. And then I worked with a sculpture grad at Alfred to pour a solution of tin and silver to make my own mirror. Um, when you make your own mirror, it's two-sided. So both sides were reflective and it was also transparent. Um, it was a really fun to, thing to do and I would like to do it again, but it's also very expensive. So can't get too excited about that. Um, yeah, so as you step onto the platform and you ready yourself to look and see, you immediately encounter a hazy reflection. The mirror conjures intimacy, the allure of pleasure, curiosity and desire. I wanted the theater box to be the space for reflection. Um, for people to think about the spectacle of gaze. I wanted viewers to acknowledge and consider the fact that without me explicitly asking, there was no verbal cue. Um, people were willing and like eager to put themselves in the position to observe. Like there was at the opening night, there was a line of people waiting to get up there and look to see what you would see. Um, and I guess that just kind of makes me think more about like, what does it mean to be so powerless to our curiosities and our desires? Uh, so, okay, so what you're looking at now is the start to that big installation. This is how it began with a digital drawing. Um, I, drew, I drew this on my iPad and then I scaled it up and projected it on a, in a wall, a big blank wall that we had um, like access to, and I covered that wall with paper. So you can see here, here's an image of me on the floor tracing the projection. So I was tracing the projection on paper to make templates. 
so that I could then um, build this in a more manageable scale. So you can see on the right, I think I'm making like this part. And these ones were like suspended in space. These weren't wall, wall tiles, but it was really fun to make this because it was a big challenge with, sometimes I would have to do like four symmetrical thing, like objects. So I would have to like jump back and forth on either side of the table and try to remember what my hands had just done. So it was like a big exercise of trying to keep up with myself. Um, so, and here is an image from install. Uh, after I had fired all of the pieces, I went back and made a second set of templates of the now fired pieces. And then I projected that image back on the wall and pinned those up. And this was a just a whole, this was a whole ordeal. And I don't know that this is the best system, but it's my system. Um, and this is something that I wanna keep doing now that I'm here at Amoka and I have the space to do that. I would like to build more wall work because it is something you can do um, with smaller kilns. I can make something this grand um, without needing a six foot kiln. Uh, okay, and so this is my last slide. These are pictures that I just took. Um, we unloaded this piece last night. Thanks, Nathan and Tim. <laughs> um, this is the, this isn't the first thing I made here, but this is kind of the first like or most in progress work that I have going here. Um, it is going to be a chair that people can sit on. At least that's the hope. <laughs> um, once again, I'm back to the problem of the legs and I'm trying to to resolve that, but I think I've got I think I've got a good system in the works using steel and wood. Um, yeah, so I, I'm i gonna try to make some more functional things. Like that's gonna be a new parameter for me is function. Um, I'm excited to see how the dialogue shifts when that becomes something I'm focusing on and, and like how things will shift when these are objects that people can use. And I'm not necessarily gonna make them comfortable. <laughs> That's not something that I feel is important to do. Um, yeah. So this is this is where I'm at now, and <laughs> this is uh, things I want to keep building on while I'm here. So yeah, I think I'm done. <laughs> Thank you all for being here. Uh, we have more of Paige's work. Uh, you can visit her website at pageotool.com, which will be dropped here in the chat. Uh, and if you're in the neighborhood in Pomona or around LA, do come visit us at the Museum and Ceramic Studio. Uh, we're out in Pomona, California. You can learn more about Amoka, our ceramic studio, and our residency program by visiting our website at amoka.org. Uh, just a reminder, a recording of this presentation will be available uh, on our website in the next couple of weeks. So thanks again. Mm -hmm.